I'm very honored to be involved in organizing the South South Forum and also moderating tonight's session. Tonight, we are honored to have Professor Wen Tiechun to share with us his thoughts on the current predicaments caused by global, globalization, his reflections and the alternatives for transition. We can all observe that in today in the world, the world is facing multiple crises and the root cause, the root causes of this crisis and how to get out of them are urgent issues of concern to the countries and people of the global south. I have been following Ms. Professor Wen Tiejun and Professor Liu Jianzhi for nearly 20 years in rural, rural re, uh, reconstruction and research. Both of, both of them are the main initiators of the new rural construction movement. I have the honor to conduct research in the rural area with them, as well as to read and discuss to carry out various work under their guidance. And I continue to this day to draw knowledge and motivation from them. And I'm also infected by their stance and spirit of doing research based on the roots of the Global South. Professor Wen Tiejun is the executive dean of the Institute of Rural Reconstruction of China, Southwest University, and executive dean of the Institute of Rural Reconstruction of the Straits, Fujian Agricultural and Forestry University. He is a leading scholar on microeconomics and agrarian issues, independent non-executive director of Postal Savings Bank of China. His monography, Eight Crisis, one of the most influential books on economics in China in the last decade has been distributed in hundreds of thousands of copies in China and its English version is called 10 Crisis, the political economy of China's development. It was also published last year and Professor Wen Tiejun has bought back the rights from the publisher so that you can free download it. Uh, in the Global University website and also the Publishing House Pell Graphs website. Tonight, we also have the privilege of having two renowned panelists. Both of them are also key participants in the South South Forum. So one is Alexander Buscalin and the other is Petro, uh, Petro Perez. So later on, we will introduce them in details. We are very grateful for their presence. Now let's start with Professor Wen's speech. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to give you a, a, a story to be the the, uh, the opening of my presentation. Uh, it's about 20 years ago. Uh, uh, Professor Qin Chi Lao led us to do the comparative study in developing countries. At that time, a very uh, you know important phenomena make me have a very impressive uh, 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 ex exchange with others. My 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 thoughts at that time there's a, somehow the the people join the march. The slogan is that um, don't owe, not pay. Don't owe, not pay is a very important uh, uh, slogan because that time is most of these uh, developing countries, they got to pay their debts to the developed country. I mean, from the, the South pay to the North. So as, a, as that is a, the, not only in 1990s, but also in 1980s. I remember in the beginning of 1990s, the whole of the, uh, the foreign reserve in China, less than the total amount of the payments of the foreign debts. So that time, the debts is really very heavy. It's a problem, it's a key issue of developing countries. But now you can see the debts, in Western countries, I mean, in the North, became much more than the developing countries. 
Now, developing countries like China to be maybe the top one or top two in the world, the that the, the, the owner, I mean, they gave money to these uh, Western countries and then Western countries cannot pay back. So this time we may see that the Western country, I mean, especially the, the United States and other, uh, uh, you know, uh, imperialist countries, they will organize a kind of uh, uh, a match to say that mm, not pay, but war. So here there is a, 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 a finger to show that uh, not, nowadays the, the Originally, the First World War and Second World War all caused by the, uh, uh, the deaths. I mean, especially these uh, imperialist countries' deaths. Now the third time. I mean, I don't, I don't mean that there will be the, the Third World War, but there must be the Cold War. So the old Cold War that's happened in 1940s, we have a lot of experience to make us to understand what is Cold War. And now we must pay attention to the new Cold War, old Cold War and new Cold War. This all come from the, uh, the, the, the war made by the imperialist countries. So that is a very important argument today I want to present to you. So the first slide, as you can see, is the China strategic transition under the crisis of globalization. Because now uh, China, the, the trend of Chinese economy is relative to the G7. Now we can see the dependence of China is decreasing, but the G7, the G7 has growing, has increasing dependence in China, but of course, the rank of China can be can be different according to different aspects. But in the real economy, China is the first one, is the is the top one. So now, if we examine this in the history in the nineteenth century, China was already the first economy. Economy it, it was just because it was under. It was suffered from the invasion of the imperialism, and the reason was because China has enjoyed a long-term uh, surplus, trade surplus, and so that China was having a large amount of uh, the reserve of gold and silver. At that time, China using gold, oh, sorry, using silver as the currency. So in the uh, on the aspects of the reserve of uh, heavy of the precious metal of the economy volume, China was the top one. But because China has this huge volume of ex export exportation, which caused the deficit of the Western countries, and the Western countries have to pay China in silver. That's why there is a silver war, which caused the uh, colonization and the triangle trade of the slave silver, which is uh, the history. And nowadays we can see China again become the first, the top one country in, in the aspects of the, of the exportation of the reserve, etc. But now we don't use silver, but we use dollar. So now China becomes the the, again, one of the top countries who has the hugest, the, 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 the biggest amount of the federal, the, the, the um, reserve, the foreign currency reserve. Now, MB was murdered just yesterday, and which also caused a lot of heated discussion. What it is related to is the Western country, the debt, the not being able to pay the debt. Uh, which is led by the American, because Japan and China are both the top two countries that have, that is the biggest uh, creditor, uh, the, the creditor country, and America is the the biggest um, debtor country. So it's the same under the same logic that when you are owing you when you own people to a lot to the other countries, you have to start a war. So nowadays we're facing the same problem when the countries are 
in in huge in deep in deep depth they will have to start a war so in from this from this graphic you can see that in the the second both of the world war is also caused by the debt so now we already have a higher higher uh, a, a higher debt than nowadays of the global debts we're talking about so will there be a third war we, we don't know yet if we examine this if we examine the crisis we can see that it's called it is caused by the western countries huge debts how they can do to deal with it they can of course issuing more currency just like america keep doing the qe because they need to buy their own governmental bonds but no matter how they no matter how they is no matter how much currency they, they, they issue but we can see that all the money go into the commodities and which in its turn cause the inflation of the whole the international market so they use the the, the inflation of the global market to absorb those American dollars, which is the same way that American government deal with the the crisis. No matter it's, uh, it's Trump, no matter it's Biden or Obama, they always issued more currency to try to solve their their economic problems. But now the problem is we are in the midst of the uh, pandemic, so now we don't have enough supply chain. So. And all the same time, China was issuing, starting a, 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 issue, a trade war against China. So now we have this inflation in America, which uh, also in the commodities, and China also raised the price, the price of the of the in, in exportations. And now in uh, this circle, America has a higher price in of the all the consumer goods. So now it's in this dilemma that is the inflation problem in which cost when it issued more money and cost the price going up in the commodities and in turn causing their own inflation so in this kind of situation this there this is a cycle a cycle of currency and it break its own cycle this is American, what American uh, politic, pol uh, politic, politicians, they only have, they have a very, very narrow vision. They only see their, the, the, the interest that is in front of them. They cannot see the long term because um, America's uh, uh, currency issuing already caused their own inflation and they cannot surpass this. They cannot deal with it because they now Japan and China uh, well, it are the biggest creditor country. So in order to break out of their dilemma, America has to has to has to has to uh, go back to these two countries. So when I was doing the research, uh, research field research with uh, with the Professor Lau at that time, I remember in the nineties, China doesn't have enough uh, foreign foreign reserve because compared to our our debt we are in deficit so at that time at that time china's finance uh foreign 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 reserve they're all in deficit so at that time china was china was a debtor country and and, the, and those creditor countries asking you to pay back but now it's reversed because now is the developed countries asking the developing countries like china to uh that they are in debt now it's american that is in debt at that time china already keep giving chinese lessons keep trying to asking china to change the institution institution but now that china as the biggest debt country can china send out a delegation to ask america to change their system to change their institution because if you can we say can we tell them, can we lecture them to to can we lecture them saying that if you don't pay us back you have to change your system of course not so now there are lots of uh, major issues happening these are all the symptoms that is pre-war uh, which we can see uh, in history in pre the first world first world war the second world war the so-called of the end of the civilization it's just another and it's just the date end of the capitalism on, on their way 
according to Sami Ami, is just there in explosion. In order to delay this ex in explosion, they have to transfer their cost. But now that they have problem, they are blocks. This kind of trans tran tran transition is blocked, so they can only start a trade war or a cold war. How come the civilization comes to an end? There is a law, there is an objective law that we can follow. So all the all what we are observing today is just uh, Americans inflation is getting worse and worse. Every time when they have an inflation is also kind of linked with the with their QE policy. Because once they have this QE policy, they start to run their their, their printing machine of the of the American dollar and all this money that they, they are trying to with all this money they are trying to transfer out the crisis to the developing countries trying to cause this external inflation but now they have an internal inflation and that is the process so china has a phrase saying that you use the stone you lift up the stone and you smash up on your own feet this is uh, exactly the bubble that america is going through now because now this bubble is about to burst and one of the most important reason is because we also talked about in the globalization the the book that in a globalization where we talked about the smiling uh, curve because when the countries starting their um starting their uh, starting to print out more currencies they just transfer all the crisis to the developing countries especially those with the resources for example and then trying to raise increase the the increase their price of the primit primitive uh, materials so they are actually to be free riding the financial capital countries any country that have sovereignty that can control their own export, they become an exception. For example, Russia is currently trying to recover its touch of sovereignty. And because of the rising price of oil and gas, it's benefiting from the inflation created by the US. It's the same with Iran. The US stopped sanctioning Venezuela because it's Pressing it to produce more petrol. All country with serenity in terms of resources have this issue. On the very first as Sasa Forum, we talk about this three as principle. The first one is the serenity of resources. Any country with this, the serenity, they can free right the rising price of commodities caused by the inflation in America, printing money from America. From this, the rising price in commodity eventually will become global inflation. China as the biggest producer, uh, the, there should be a bumbling zone it, there used to be a problem for China in this regard, but now there's no more because there is this new Cold War. Because they don't have a real politicians, they don't have the great mindset. They just use the same repertoire from the old Cold War, like anti-communism. They collect a group where they form an alliance of so-called democratic market countries who are all deeply indebted. We all agree that because of this inflation caused by this incurable cycle, in Germany, for example, has 9% or more inflation higher than 8% in the US. So there is this current new trend all these costs from this capitalist countries are having an inevitable outcome from the inevitable law. So in this, under this condition, global capital goes to East Asia. 
like Japan and China, who are producers, manufacturers, who have big growth economy and big exports. But then in the first quarter of this year, Japan has a trade deficit, but in the past it always has a surplus. China and Japan are the biggest creditors of the US because of all these surpluses. To prevent capital from going to China or Japan, struggles in terms of ideology and this new Cold War, if this cannot go on with the US, there will be local or regional war, regional hot war conflicts. This is inevitable. So around in the regions around China or Japan, there is a high probability of regional hot war. So I believe the South South Forum uh, comes in a timely manner with its theme because we have a pressing threat, impending threat of war. We must notice and take note that they are caused by those indebted imperialist countries. Whenever they win a war, they can take advantage of the assets of the countries who lose who, lose, who have lost lose this war and they can continue with this circle so the old cold war the new cold war the post cold war are what my summarization of the global conditions are to help you understand the changes after the second world war and how they launch a cold war and how this is a continuation i remember back in 1989 when the old cold war is ending and we're coming to a new post cold war era mr deng xiaoping said that i used to think that there will no longer be a cold war but i think there will be new new cold wars his judgment was right but we have to take note that the old Cold War turning into the post Cold War and the current new Cold War. In this process, we have to take note that there is analysis of the post Cold War. The post Cold War is largely due to the fact that the US and Europe received a great amount of dividend of peace from the collapse of the USSR. That's because the USSR has rich resources and a big, big system. So once it collapsed, the real assets, which are not monetized, had to face the hard currency from the vast, which came into the country. And they hipped all the interest from this. In, at that time, many European currencies were pushing forward in the former USSR system to monetize their assets. The US dollar was doing the same. The more closer European countries benefited the most. In 1992 or 1993, just two or three years from the collapse of the USSR, there were developments. And only in 1994, the EU came into being because of the benefits they got. They got. This integrated Europe has a bulk share of revenue from resources and real economy. So, they can support a single currency of the euro so the euro came into being therefore the major enemy arc enemy of the the us became the eu of course us does not just sit southern it organized this north american free trade area so during this post Cold War uh, era, there is no real Cold War. It's just that the contradiction became the struggle between the Euro bloc and the dollar bloc. 
We can see that during this process, everyone is trying to expand their financial capital. This is caused by the law, objective law that financial capital will be expanding like unprecedentedly. Because the US has military hegemony, it always maintained its place in well, maintain its big share in global settlement in terms of trade. As the US tried to launch a, or put, stage another war in the EU, in the EU, it has lost some of its previous advantages. We know that Donald Trump was without much political training and he's more of a businessman. And he decided that the arc enemy of the US was China. And he also said the EU was also the US enemy so that the EU needs to fall apart and the, the Euro has to go. He was quite blunt and direct. So because of the challenges from the Euro, the US has to use its military hegemony to so military conflicts around China or around Europe so that they can downplay the stronger economic and currency systems that may challenge the US. In this regard, this is very different from the ideology of the old Cold War era. If it is also very different from the old Marxist Leninist ideology before World War II. So we should encourage exchange so that we can forego old ideology and take note of the principal contradiction. We should use the basic rules of Marxism to analyze our principal contradictions. As I said, during this era, all the measures that you asked to majorly used to prevent its downfall in the financial capital competition. It relied heavily on its military hegemony, which heavily relied on its Anglo-Saxon model. This model is very, very expensive, a extremely expensive. It expands. It tries to shift the contradiction to a new, to a different continent where there is this more stable drawing model. The Anglo-Saxon model is way worse than the Rhine model. So it is a competition in essence between the Anglo-Saxon model and the Rhine model, this war between US and Europe. Well, China and Japan, the biggest creditors in the world belong to a East Asia model. This is also our new summary and categorization of the current contradictions. It may not be the most appropriate, but this is an unacceptable way. Under the Angelo Sex model, a cohort one, it's some radical capitalism. So in these regions, they have the most polarized polarization in terms of poverty. They have rich poor, very bad rich poor polarization. I won't go to great details of examples. Uh, I would like to speed up a little bit. As we know, we have an important idea of shifting the cost. The theory talks about how crisis will abound during the, the collapse of the globalization, not just the developed countries, but also developing countries will also experience crisis. The difference lies in the fact that the South countries cannot shift the cost. The North countries like the US can shift this cost to the whole world 
through its hegemony, even through war. So despite its polar rich poor polarization, it can print more money to solve its problem. Only when the inflation is very bad, they would considerably stop this expansion. So the vast have this advantage of being able to shift to the cost. We've talked about this before. And now I would like to talk about how China was dealing with this global crisis of globalization. I won't go to great details of the past experiences. Let's just talk about the current this situation, the status quo. Since the beginning of the trade war between China and the US, even in, during the later years of the Obama administration, they decided to shift its military focus to China, around to the regions around China. So China has to consider shifting from a C, a land power strategy to sea power strategy. We currently face a war between Russia and Ukraine. Many countries took stunts, but China remains neutral. Because in terms of economics, China, with both Russia and Ukraine have a complementary status. They have raw materials and China is a very big manufacturing country, the biggest, and it can cover the mid Europe and even vast Europe market. So there is great complementarity in this regard. So as the conflict break broke out between these two countries, China still continue to import raw uh, crude oil from Russia and even increase its import. And China will continue to import food from Ukraine. This is some example of this complementarity. So we need this land route. And we're also developing similar land power strategy with South countries. We have a Afrasian land bridge, a third land bridge, Afrasian, Africa to Asia land bridge, Afrasian land bridge. It mainly goes from the Pearl River Delta region of Hong Kong to form a Afro-Asian railway and to the south west of China and goes to South Asia and then goes to West Asia and through the Arabian Peninsula to South uh, to North Africa where it connects the Pan-African route and it goes all the way down to Johannesburg of South Africa. In the in the system, uh, it also includes vast Africa. It goes up from South Africa and connects Tunisia in the end. So this land bridge may cover about sixty percent of the world's population and about fifty percent of this region's GDP. In this regard, the Belt and Road Initiative launched by China in this era of global crisis caused by the implosion of global financial capital, it can help regional development, this, this Belt and Road Initiative. This was built on top of China's own experience of when this, when Ch and as Chinese say that if you want to be rich, we must build roads. And China helped the developing countries with their infrastructure, especially road construction and extraction of resources so that they can develop their economy better. So this is a totally different development mode from the vast one, especially the Anglo-Saxon one, which provides a new vision of 
human beings' development. We must take note that there is a fundamental change in China's current development strategy. It's the modernization that features the peace and harmony between human beings and the environment. If this modernization destroys the environment, then it is not desirable. So China now have this harmonious modernization between human and nature. This is an essential part of China's civilization and even its foundation because it's its foundation. So China tries to jump out of the old Western development model so that they can have an inclusive, sustainable development. This is the human civilization in this new 21st century that had its own, it's a choice that made by human civilization. There is hegemony of who's the best, who's the most powerful is not concerned. Uh, as the old cold, new Cold War ends, hegemony will also goes to an end. All the Belt and Road countries participated voluntarily nobody was forced to do anything from this angle we can see that china's development momentum will be completely totally different from that of the us so let's discuss the differences between the, the differences between china and the us so we are what we really focus is the sovereignty credit the sovereignty credit comes from two sides. One is the, the currency, the other is the bonds, which are derivatives from the sovereignty. But the biggest difference between China and America is that the America has, is the, the, the policy are made by the private bankers. The Fed, the Federal Reserve is made up of private bankers. If the, for example, if the government, the American government wants to, want to, want to, um, have more military expenses. The only way they can do is to issuing more, um, more the federal bonds, the treasury bonds, because they already they don't have any more real, real economy. And in order to have to issuing more, more uh, treasury 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 bonds, they can they only can go through the Fed. So in America, the hegemony is controlled in the hands of the bankers. But in China, it's different. The it's decided all the um, the treasury, the government, the the monetary policy is decided by the sovereignty on the basis of whether if it is necessary. Necessary. So what that is one point I would like to raise the awareness, especially in the developing countries, and especially in China, we consider capital as the the production factor instead of to hide up or to bury the production it is just a factor the capital is just a factor so the investment in the poor area is not seeking repay is not seeking returns although because when china when the government is investing in the poor area the expected returns are very low and uh, but it's just because it is invested there is because it needs to be done it need to develop the area so i was once the independent uh independent manager of the of the uh of the independent of the uh postal saving banks so we can i can observe that at that time the policies are all are all are all made in that way this is that this bank is is the bank only has one function that's to that is to to uh, to service for the um agriculture peasants and also the rural area but of course there are problems in it but when it comes to the basic function china's finance has a fu fundamental difference from the from that of america it's just like when mao, when mao zedong is in yan'an is when he is lecturing the 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 petit bourgeoisie that they have to tell difference between china and the west 
that is also one point that I have been stressing since 10 years ago. That's what, please pay attention to why, why, why Mao Zedong and Ian An is already trying to tell, trying to let people to know the difference between Yan An and Xi An. The uh, Xi An is the another city in China. So now in the capitalism, when this kind of financialized capitalism on its way to the dead end, we know that there's no country without any problem. All the countries have its own issues, but we have to see what is the main contradiction. Now is the American US dollar block and the China sovereignty, sovereignty block. So in this, in this financialized capitalism, apart from the empowerment of the credit, that we just explained, it has a fundamental difference. So there, for China, there's only one way. You can only, you can only to, um, you can only to strengthen the, you can only strengthen the, the real economy, the uh, sovereignty, so that China can have a stronger finance. But of course, China has its own issues. For example, that um, there are lots. There are lots of provinces in China doesn't have any physical balances because they are all in deficits, in fiscal deficits. Of course, uh, we would like them to 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 uh, reduce its expenses, but what the main pro the main reason is because we have been investing in the poor poor area in the rural area, so there is no returns which is different from America where they put the money in the military expenses, which resulted in the, in China, this kind of investment, we invest of the crisis, we have this kind of adjustment called the counter cyclical adjustment because we put the money, we invest in the poor, in the less developed area, because we 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 would like to using the infrastructure, infrastructure to to sustain the industrial capital, which the West has suffered in the in the in the past. China is already China already seen the decay the the, the decay of the real estate. So we would like to put the money in the real economy, which is, for example, is the infrastructure in the rural area. I have been living in the mountains now these days. And every day when I walk out, you can see that every household already connected to the to the to the road, to they already have Wi, they have in internet connection, they have power and also the tap water. So this is the China's five communications um, policy, which means the five, uh, including the, the gas, the water, the power, the internet, and the road. That's why in China, almost have enjoyed 100% of coverage of power of electricity, and also the cleaner, the, the clean energy that we were using the, we're using the, the solar, the sonar, the uh, hydro hydraulic power. So now the because because in, it was the increase of the coverage of electricity, we would like to use the clean energy. So all this money is used is invested in the infrastructure. So although China, although the local provinces has their debt, but it's used in the investment in the infrastructure, in the real economy. So it's different from America, where America is in debt, but is not used, all the debt is not used in the, is not invested in the, in the real economy. So China, America has that fail of the debt, but it doesn't wake, it doesn't give a wake up call to anyone. America's real is economy doesn't have, has less than 13% of this GDP, the rest are all the service sector. So when it's issuing, when it is issue, issuing more, more money, it's only, it's not, it's not used in the real economy. This is, uh, we call this is a, a, a upside down pyramid, the Americans, uh, Americans, Americans asset structure. 
they can only trying to try trying to hit on uh trying to defeat the 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 depth the creditor the credit the creditor the creditor country so that they can cancel their debt because now it is in a very unstable economy china has a very stable economy structure it has a lot of uh, real economy as you can see in the photo that it has more than 10 trillion us dollar real economy so although we do have the of, of the debt which is the top bit is in the real economy if you divide that debt to the assets it is actually not that much so china has this stable stable structure although in face of the of the explosion of crisis who can stand firm who is the who is the responsible one to their own people because you are not going to fall when the global crisis is having its explosion so in so at this in at this times of the situation at this times anything can happen now we also have another strategy that is called the cross psychological which means we are going to cross the this phase of crisis of capitalism we are going to cross over this phase and we're going to enter an ecological civilization so that's why china is doing a very major is uh, it's doing major strategic strategic adjustment that we are going to pro people using the two mountain strategy which is focus focusing on the eco uh the eco, eco ecology to get out of trying to get out of the capitalism phase where the ecology is sacrificed so when we are doing this this pro pro uh, people policy and pro eco civilization the first actor factor is whether if we can stand firm stand firm in front of this um this crisis global crisis and what we do is to invest in the rural area, uh, rural area, trying to expand the real economy in the in the village, so that our economy won't having a self demise. But this is a transition because we want to sustain our economy so that we can sustain the unemployment and to reduce the risk of the social conflicts. The next step is to change to the eco civilization because we cannot using this kind of uh, this kind of this kind of structure of using lots of expenses and just to produce for the waste the past the production method of the past cannot be sustained we have been trying to alert from two decades ago but of course um, the policy adjustment of the central government is not because of our it's not because of our like lectures but because of the western what the western culture is facing because now we can see very clear that we cannot sustain the economy in the way of producing for the west so now you can see that the new situation in china no matter is a the, those big companies those big enterprises what they have is always they're trying to produce is always the agrium products, the agricultural products. Lots of capital are going to the rural area, going to the countryside. How can in this kind of uh, in this kind of clash, okay, or in this kind of the capital going to the village? How can we help to sustain to protect the farmers' rights? That is also another way that we are another question that we are going to deal with because as we can see lots of people for example apart from the capital apart from the apart from the um the human apart from the 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 cap surplus capital investment there's also human capital that is going to the countryside and on this aspect of course we also our research team is also on uh, in the front of this research because just like the moderator Yan Xiaohui has mentioned that he already followed us for 20 years doing the research in the countryside I I, I know that they are all very familiar with all these photos because when they were when when just for 20 more than 20 decades we have been trying to train the farmers and trying to 
to to train their ability to to negotiate with the for, with the outside outside capital in mo not only just the farmers but also the, the the citizens because now citizens are also going to the rural area trying to start some some business with the local business and to do some green economy i believe this is also one of the core job core work that we are doing in the rural country countryside in the rural area so this is also what we are doing to promote the agriculture from 1.0 to 4.0 which we already explained in another book so when we are trying to to uh, to re revert, revitalize revitalize the the village economy we are based on their on their ecological factors on their ecological resources we know that in the in, in the village there's always the mountain that divides the become the division of the geolog geological uh, geological villages so and also uh, also the rivers so when what we are doing nowadays like now we have a when we have a scarcity of population of resources so what we can do is to help to to form a shareholding economic cooperatives joint in among several villages so that they can have their own have their own headquarters in the township then divide then also going to different levels in among different villages so that they can have this kind of uh, comprehensive economy and their aim is to have a to have an integrated economy let the let the farmers to be able to enjoy the dividends that this kind of um, structure we call it a three-tier market the farmers need to know what they have what kind of resources they have so that they can price their own resources and this is their their best and on the second level, they are going to combine with the investments from the government so that they can connect with the outside from the outside enterprises, which we call the township enterprises. This is this is also the micro microeconomic uh, base so that they can reach out to the to the uh, formal outside from us the the formal financial sector from outside so this is a way where they can do the self-organizing is a kind of the private enterprise that they sell by they organize by themselves and there are already lots of this kind of experience in china objectively is because when china is competing with the american capital like capital when the american capital come into china we don't open the market for exchange of uh, of the rmb market so the us dollar has to be changed into rmb which caused the expanding of rmb and the expanding of the capital so this one for example the real estate market they are not in blooming so we have this excess of capital where does the capital can flow they can flow into this three-tier market in old time lots of capital cannot lots of the resources cannot be explored cannot be capitalized but now have this kind we have this excess capital so we can we can channel them into the village and to help it to become uh, to be to help to cap to help to promote the um, eco ecological resources exploration in in the village now we need this kind of system system designing once we have more experience on this aspect we will share more with everyone so today we have limited time so i can just give everybody a rough a rough uh, introduction introduction of the global crisis which which comes from the inflation of america and also the imminent heated war the the imminent hot war where it could happen and it also it could happen uh near the area between china and japan because these are the two major creditor countries 
once these two countries are done, the West can have can enjoy the privilege of not paying the debt because when the because just like the American is trying to trying to call the Chinese virus like when the pandemic started, call it the virus the Chinese come. Chinese uh, virus and also trying to get rid of the Americans uh, investment to, to, to they're trying to they're trying to default their debt and it has been proposed many times in in 2020 and then American also have this pandemic as American studies on pandemic and this and then again they have they find that there's the lab and there is the virus strains already found in their lab so again and also american already have hundreds of this lab laboratory in around the world lots of facts coming in coming into light and they cannot using this as excuses so they just keep finding more and more excuses when they run out of excuses they are trying to come up with some other some other some other uh, some other uh, discourse just trying to not pay the debt so once we get this clear, now we can go back to the uh, China. What we can do, we have to do a transition. We cannot compete on the same level as the West. We have to do the ecological civilization. So when our power is reinvested in the ecological civilization, we call this is a cross psychological adjustment so this um, is what i'm going to share today but I've, i know there are lots of lots of issues here and i would like to hear more comments and also uh so i'm looking forward to the comments thank you so justin professor Wen analyzed the system had by the vast had this new problem in the new era of their not being able to resolve their debt crisis, which will lead to more extreme manners of resolution. In the past, they try to shift the blame of the cost, and today they may resort to war. In the past, when the developed countries are the creditors, the indebted developing countries have to sacrifice a lot of their serenity other resources and so on so that they can pay now the expansion of that cost by inflation makes the developed countries debtors in this case they do not try to find the problem from the thing but they use a different logic and try not to pay back the debts and they try to create conflicts or make difficulties for the creditors. Since 1980s, since 20, 2017, Professor Vendors warned us about the new Cold War right on this very forum. And they can see that this new Cold War have escalated into regional hot war and we can see more clearly this tendency. I believe Professor Wen's discussion, his analysis may be worth of some serious consideration for all the countries in the South. He also pointed out that these developed countries were expanding their financial capital they try to crack down or, or even destroy the currency of the developing countries. This is another way of launching a war. A new way of war may be very different from the old ones, where older ideology and older ways of thinking may be outdated. Mr. Wen also talked about China's own experiences in the recent years. The lessons learned and the ex good experiences that we want to spread like in the past they rely on sea power and now we shift to expanding land trade routes with asian african and europe countries given the different global environments they want to have a different 
blaze a different path of development. They don't want to replace a, the old expansion with a new expansion or a new hegemony with an old hegemony. They want to seek a way out without hegemony where they can really have a community of common faith of human beings. And then later, Mr. Wen also talked about some very concrete steps and measures that China took to reconstruct rural areas. Well, our Chinese friends may be more familiar with this, and this is what I have been engaging in in the past 20 years or so. It's nice to see that this rejuvenation of the rural area is in combination with our rural construction work. I'm very glad to see that. We are very thankful for Professor Wen for sharing with us his thoughts. I believe every one of us present here can take away something from his presentation. And then they would like to invite our two discussants tonight. The first one is Alexander Buzgali. Uh, I am very glad to, to participate in this uh, wonderful and very important event. Uh, my name is Alexander Buzgalin. I am professor at Moscow State University, Lomonosov Moscow State University, director of the Center of Modern Marxist Studies in this university and uh, also chief editor of the journal Alternatives. So, uh, first of all, the topic is extremely uh, important, and not simply important. This is a key question of our life, tomorrow or maybe even today. And uh, we have uh, a lot of descriptions of the situation. We know how difficult is the uh, geopolitical situation how deep contradictions we have in the sphere of ecology, how big problems we have in the sphere of social relations, uh, inequality is growing. But the question is not simply description. It is important, but not enough. The problem is to show key contradictions of the system. And if we stress these key contradictions of the system, we can show the solution. And by the way, I want to stress from the very beginning, solution can be negative. From dead end, sometimes civilization is going back. We can have regress, not progress, as solution or quasi solution of the contradictions. That's why question is extremely mm, uh, provocative. What we have tomorrow, movement in the direction of socialization, I can say socialism, or we will have reverse, regress. And this second trend is very actual now. We have a refeudalization of society. And this is trend not only in Russia, nearly everywhere. Growth of uh, pre-capitalist relations, even more brutal than capitalist, plus threat of fascism, again, everywhere. And this is key challenge. If we are talking about uh, anatomy of the modern late capitalism, we must stress uh, the following points first, and it was stressed during presentation. Uh, market became totalitarian. We are talking about totalitarianism typically in political sphere, but we all, in all countries, are living in the situation of totalitarian market. Market is totalitarian force. All human relations, education, culture, family life, even love and friendship, became social capital, human capital, sphere of competition and financialization. And this is extremely important. This is enemy. Many people will not agree with me, but I want to stress this. Totalitarian market became enemy of mankind. This is first. Second, this market is oriented on the production of simulacra, fictitious values. Uh, Michael know a lot about that. Nearly one half of production is production of uh, garbage, junk, fakes. 
what you want, but not what you need. What you want because propaganda, marketing, PR explains that without this and that sign, simulacra, you cannot survive. And people are living in this fictitious world. And this is second enemy. Typically, we don't see these enemies. They're not as urgent as war or absence of uh, heat or maybe bad weather. But this is problem which is fundamental. And this is first aspect which I want to stress. Second aspect which I want to stress, uh, problem of technology. We are talking a lot about uh, high tech, uh, about uh, nano, bio, informational, uh, cognitive technologies and so on. But this is the case for very small number of people, except uh, maybe a mobile phone, all other results of this technological development are very far from uh, everyday life of the people. And if we are talking about this, we have another question. How can we want to use and realize this technological revolution for everybody? And what will be the result? And if we are following to the trend, which is now established and realized by global capital, global capital, I want to stress this. We have tomorrow world with this described, 20% of elite and 80% of servants, like in feudal society, semi-slaves who are working as a servant for 20%. But alternative exists, and this alternative is mass creative labor. We can and we must have another world where 80% will be teachers, doctors, specialists in ecology, social work, art, culture, uh, technique, uh, science, everywhere, but not in production of fictitious uh, commodities, not in production of financial speculations and so on. So this is another aspect of uh, global capital domination. And finally, as I said, uh, problem of modern technological revolution, ecological crisis, inequality, cannot be solved by modern system of market relations and global capital domination. But what will be the solution? This depends from us. And the main threat now is negative solution. The growth of military operations, victims, more and more victims everywhere, was a permanent growth of contradictions between different countries and uh, the whole parts of the world. Threat of new world war. All these are signs that we have real threat of new fascization of the world or refeudalization of the world. And this is agenda for analysis. So finally, we can and must give uh, alternative. And this will be my last five minutes, if I have, I think I have five minutes. And these alternatives are well known, but I want to stress them again. First, we must put goal and determine goal. Nobody can talk about alternative if we don't have strategic goal. Can we determine this goal? It will be big debates, by the way. From our point of view, it's not only my position in our country, in between our friends, a network of alternatives and so on. We are talking about development of personality and creative labor and social justice. Uh, I will put slogan, which will be not maybe popular now. Creative labor as need, a sphere of self-realization for everybody not consumption, even for people who are hungry, not simply climate, but mass creative labor, free development of personality and culture. Why? Because if we are moving in such direction of labor, organization, of economic, social, political life, cultural life, we have people who will move our life, will move our countries, and even mankind 
in the necessary direction. Socialism can be uh, also a very contradictory system. In 20th century, we had a lot of systems who, has name, uh, who had name socialism, but really led to the dead end. That's why problem is not simply nationalization, state property, even plan. But problem is strategic goal. And this is, I want to stress again, uh, personality with creative labor. And by the way, I will mention one also very provocative aspect. The main victories of Soviet Union everywhere, including World War II, we are based on the communist enthusiasm. We had not only enthusiasm, we had bureaucracy, we had gulag, we had uh, elements of market and so on. But real victories were based on the revolutionary enthusiasm, on the social creativity, and on the mass, very high quality education, science, art, spheres where creative people were creating new life. That's why we defeated world fascism, that's why we had success in cosmos and everywhere. That's why we want to stress again these goals and these aspects. Is it possible to realize such goals inside modern system of capitalist market relations? Generally speaking, not. But we can have and must fight for deep reforms. And deep reforms are possible with this strategic goal. And with, I can say, revolutionary struggle for reforms as first step in the future, maybe qualitatively new society. And these changes, these reforms are well known, and we want to talk about them again. Basic, uh, maybe, need free access to fundamental resources of development of everybody, free of charge quality medicine, healthcare system, generally speaking free of charge uh, for everybody, quality education, free of charge, quality life, opportunities for life. Uh, I don't know, houses, just well, not only. Opportunity to have more and more uh, labor with creative content. We can fight for such reforms. And this will be first step. Second step will be struggle for decline of inequality. Let's talk everywhere about progressive income tax up to 90% for millionaires. Let's talk about uh, uh, social benefits for people who don't have work, but not as uh, something which they can eat every day, but as uh, training for new quality labor. Let's create for them labor opportunities, not simply money. Let's create for them opportunities of self-organization. And final point, political changes, which are also well known, grassroots democracy. But we don't talk enough about this aspect. And accumulation of experience of mass movements from Latin America, Africa, Asia, our country, by the way, too, even Soviet experience of 1920s, experience of US working class and intelligentsia fighting for their rights. Let's try to make model, theoretical model of grassroots democracy, which is not elaborated. We have a lot of practical examples, experience, but we don't have really developed theoretical model. It, it, let's say new constitution and social requirements in this sphere, political requirements. If we will do this, we will have agenda. We will have program. And it will be a lot of common places in this program which we can realize together. Sorry. Uh, and sorry for the atmosphere. I'm, I have vacations and I have to work in the cafe, so it's not very comfortable for everybody. Thank you so much, and I hope my provocative talk uh, will be adequate for future debates. Thank you. And he was talking about a very, a very important issue is, which is relevant to everybody, is, for example, the 
capitalism and the global market because they have caused many problems and we cannot continue to to stay in this system we have to find an alternative and also a new blueprint for everybody for our future and also he has a very interesting point he said we have to create creative labor instead of trying to create more consumption this is very important because the capitalism is always based on the consumption the production and consumption everybody treats the earth as the resource and the people as cons consumer our labor is becoming a kind of like a consumptive action we are coerced in this process so now how can we create creative or productive labor instead of consumption instead of just pure consumption and also he also talked about the socialism that we have to expand the more public domain instead of just keep capitalized capitalization and also private 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 privatization i think this and on this point um professor hudson might have some 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 ideas to share also so next we have our next discussant that is uh, pedro Baez perez he was the former chair of the economic research institute at the at the uh, more than just one universities in latin america he is also currently an independent analyst, and he was a he was former of the former minister of economy of Ecuador, and deputy minister of finance, superintendent of market power control, and also plenipotentiary president delegate for the new financial architecture negotiations, promoting the preparation of the Bank of the South. And also, of course, he is also one of the fun founding members of the Global University. So now, welcome, Professor Perez, by, um, Professor Baez Perez. So uh, we would like to hear what you, what comment you have on the speech of uh, Professor da Professor Wan. Thank you. Thank you, Xiaoyu. Uh, thank you very much, uh, the organizers of this forum. Um, uh, it's been a, a pleasure to hear both interventions by Wen Tijun and uh, Alexander Busgalin. Basically, I'm uh, totally in, uh, in synchrony with this type of analysis and propositions. I'd like to, um, to build uh, upon these uh, interventions, trying to set up some uh, convocations for very short-term uh, tasks for the progressive movements. We, I have some, uh, some very short uh, minutes here to to talk, so I'll uh, start from the from the end. Um, we need to understand not only the crisis of capitalism, but also the capitalism of crisis. How the um, oligarchic elite, the oligarchic financial speculative elite, is uh, um, profiting out of this type of uh, crisis, and how can we, from the from the progressive movements, from the so grassroots uh, movements could uh, set up an agenda uh, for the building uh, of um, a new uh, correlation of forces that could prevent precisely what uh, Alexander Busgalin talked about uh, uh, the, the dangers of a, 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 a negative outcome of this uh, uh, historical bifurcation. Uh, first of all, we need to face the immediate danger of um, a, a food crisis this year. We are not talking about something in the future. Is in the in the in the few in the few months that we have to face uh, the situation uh, very very similar to what happened in uh, 2008 to 2009. Um, uh, out of a real uh, shortage uh, in the supply side, the speculative uh, powers had amplified the effects of the crisis in order to have uh, extraordinary profits. Uh, see which is the, 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 the performance of, uh, of uh, enterprises like uh, Glencore or Trafigura 
from uh, the Rothschild family in, uh, in Switzerland, or the traditional um, ABCD, uh, ADM, Bunjanborn, Cargill, and Dreyfus, that traditionally appear, appears in the, uh, appeared in the, in the, in the um, uh, specialized uh, uh, analysis about the food markets. The FAO, the uh, Food and uh, Agriculture and uh, uh, Administration of the United Nations had calculated that this time is 1.7 billion human beings that there are in danger of suffering uh, famine uh, due to this, uh, not only uh, increasing prices of all the value chain of, of, of food, including uh, fertilizers and, and other, other inputs, but uh, also uh, real shortages that uh, very suspiciously had been accompanied by a, a series of, of bombings, a series of accidents between quotes in several parts of the world, including the United States of, um, of a warehouse. Uh, warehouses of, of, of uh, in, uh, huge warehouses of food that uh, uh, increase the level of uncertainty in this market in order to provoke um, a, a panic in the markets and to, to obtain these uh, short-term gains. Exactly the same had happened during uh, the crisis uh, or after the implosion of, of Lehman Brothers and um, it was preventable. Unfortunately, um, uh, friends in the left, friends in the heterodox camp, uh, camp in economics and um, in, the, in the progressive governments in the world were uh, skeptical about the possibilities of uh, preventing that situation. Uh, from Latin America, we had uh, uh, obtained at the General Assembly of the United Nations the um, uh, correlation of forces that could uh, uh, open the doors for the issue of special drawing rights from the uh, IMF, the International Monetary Fund. Uh, of course, this uh, provokes a lot of, a lot of uh, 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 irritation in, uh, in several sen sensitivities in the, in the left, in the progressive side. Uh, but the IMF had uh, this type of instrument since the 60s, but they didn't, they didn't want to issue them. Uh, they hate the special drawing rights precisely because they cannot impose conditionalities to the countries. They cannot uh, uh, use this type of instruments as a mechanism of, of blackmailing the countries. Uh, like uh, what they had with uh, the traditional uh, um, uh, adjusting programs, uh, the traditional uh, uh, MOUs um, uh, and uh, conditionality uh, agreements with the countries in order precisely to uh, uh, break down the spine, the moral spine, not only the, the economic sovereignty, but the moral spine of the countries and to um, extract uh, up to the last uh, drop of blood uh, on social energy and, and, uh, and plus value from our economies to the uh, 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 financial centers. So we need to uh, 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 fight this time uh, in a very wide mobilization of every single movement without any type of sectarism in order to prevent immediately to prevent the possibility of using this type of uh, 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 economic war against the peoples, um, precisely uh, with creative in, in, uh, innovations, uh, even within the, uh, the, 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 the uh, financial oligarchy institutions, like in this case, the, the International Monetary Fund, uh, that uh, it could uh, open the doors of could uh, inject a little bit of oxygen into the margin of maneuver of the governments in the world. This time, this time is not only the third world countries that uh, uh, are going to face uh, very, very dire challenges in terms uh, of the immediate future, but also some countries in, um, in Europe. Uh, one of the main targets of this uh, Ukrainian crisis provoked by uh, NATO 
is precisely the destruction of the economy and the uh, degradation of the political situation in, in Europe uh, in order precisely to uh, uh, neutralize this uh, uh, in, the, in the framework of the inter-imperialist uh, uh, disputes, uh, to neutralize the economic power uh, and to uh, improve the, the profit uh, conditions, the profitability conditions of the Anglo-American uh, transnationals. They had already neutralized uh, Japan uh, through the uh, policies implemented or, or, or blackmailed uh, with the Plaza Accords and the Louvre Accords at the end of the 80s. And uh, um, Japan has uh, had uh, 30 years of depression, uh, artificially provoked, provoked uh, depression, uh, precisely from the monetary, financial, and macroeconomic policies uh, imposed by uh, their very intimate partners in the uh, Trilateral Commission. Now we need to understand that this is part of the uh, geopolitical game, and this is not a technical issue, and we uh, have to uh, 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 overcome some, some of the, of the uh, dogmas uh, in the left saying, oh, but this is reformism, this is, this is not, uh, this is not a, a radical program because it, it involves uh, the, 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 the imperialist institutionality. We need to save human being, beings. And uh, this is the first, the first task we need to discuss, uh, or, or, or perhaps maybe in this mirror, in the same forum. And the second one is related to the, um, the new uh, the international debt trap. In the same way that they have uh, repeated the same receipt that they uh, used already in 2008, 2009 to provoke a, a panic in the specific uh, of, uh, uh, speculative markets related to the, the, uh, the, the, the chain value of, of, uh, of food and, and, uh, um, and agricultural uh, uh, production and distribution worldwide. They are repeating the same res uh, recipe that they, would, they could uh, implement during the crisis at the end of the 70s. And uh, uh, they are, are looking for uh, further results. Uh, again, in this case, the strategic results are not only related to the global south, like in the, in the, in the debt crisis of the, uh, of the 80s, the, debt, the, the global south and the uh, former uh, state socialist countries in the uh, Eastern Europe, but today uh, one of the main targets are uh, the countries and the economies of the uh, continental Europe. Uh, let me explain with a little bit of detail. Um, uh, during the 70s, they had an uh, uh, impasse uh, between the uh, uh, rate of profit that the big corporations, the oligarchical corporations had um, uh, in uh, proportion to the global uh, rate of profit of the entire capitalist class. Uh, they had, uh, let me explain better, they had very good profit rates and they had increased the, 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 the level of profit uh, uh, quantities, the profit mass, but they needed uh, in, the, in their, in their, in their greed, uh, greedy uh, uh, agenda, they needed to increase the part of the pay that, that they had. So they imposed a, a, um, a, a war in the, against not only the working classes, but against the South. And it was a very uh, disputed situation during the whole decade. Uh, stagflation was invented as a part of this dispute among the different fractions of the capitalist class, not only between um, uh, capital and labor, but uh, among the different fractions of capital, especially among the uh, financial oriented and the uh, monopolic productive capitalist that uh, the, could imp in increase the prices even in an environment of uh, very low growth. Um, they uh, push for very low interest, nominal interest rates in the 
in the at the at the at the interior of the trilateral commission but at the global level but this time was floating into interest rates like today with in this case we have all, also negative interest uh, uh, rates negative nominal interest rates they push for for uh, over indebtedness especially in the third world uh, um, john perkins had written as a as a, a, a first person a protagonist and 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 uh, and uh, a witness of this situation how can they uh, uh, forced uh, blackmail the countries uh, both in the private sector and the and the public sector in order to engage in unnecessary uh, indebtedness and uh, projects with the, the American transnationals and banks, and when they had uh, this aggressive indebtedness, um, they uh, tried to increase the, the interest rate with the hysteria of the uh, extrapolation. It was very difficult during the 70s, uh, even in the, for the second uh, Carter administ administration, they had a, an important segment of, of left-wing uh, economists uh, trying to push for a more progressive alternative uh, against the, the final outcome of the, of the monetarist uh, uh, impronta. Uh, but uh, they had at this time uh, something uh, falling from the sky, the fall of the Shah of Iran and uh, the increase of prices of oil prices to $40 uh, per barrel. And uh, today we have a repetition of the same script. Um, they are crying for uh, hyperinflation. Uh, this is totally hysteria. Uh, hyperinflation is defined by the same monetarist the textbooks as something like 50% per month. And today in the United States and Europe, they had uh, eight, 12% per year, and they are calling hyperinflation in order to push precisely this agenda of uh, uh, bankruptcy all around the world and uh, uh, concentration and centralization of capital uh, but also uh, in order to obtain some specific goals, uh, uh, geopolitical goals, in order to prevent the uh, decline, the hegemonic decline of the Anglo-American uh, sphere, especially related to uh, 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 speculation. Um, so now the dilemma, the dilemma for the, for the West to say something, uh, the dilemma for the uh, financial oligarchy is how to uh, increase interest rates like in the 80s and to provoke this debt trap uh, when they have um, uh, um, a huge and uh, very complicated process of uh, endogenous turbulence in the financial sector that affect the same uh, headquarters of their power the big banks and the big on the huge uh, uh, investment funds uh, that uh, uh, require a continuation with different names and different uh, specific technical forms of the quantitative easing and that means the injection of liquidity and at the same time to uh, 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 change the monetary policy in order to excuse me should i stop Okay, uh, so they, they have a dilemma because they need to increase the international interest rates in order to provoke a new debt trap worldwide. And at the same time, they need a, a, a further injections, a continuous injections of liquidity. So the alternative is precisely with uh, what uh, Alexander uh, Buzgalin was uh, suggesting the um, a, a very uh, rapid constitution of this neo-feudalist uh, situation, uh, or what uh, Varoufakis had called the, the techno-feudalism, um, is the in the in the con, in the confluence of the and the articulation very very rapid. This has happened in the in the last seven years, in the last fifteen years, but uh, much more rapidly during the last seven years. The constitution of new platform uh, of of articulation among the, the speculative instruments of financial capital, the speculative uh, side of financial capital, the financial monopolies, 
uh, at this time are not only the big banks, they need to, they, they had to uh, uh, put in the first line a, a new protagonist that are the, uh, the, the, the investment funds like uh, uh, BlackRock, uh, Vanguard, State Street, that they were present in the previous uh, episode of the crisis, but in the second, in the second uh, line, uh, after uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, JP Morgan Chase, etc. So this time, the, the internal uh, endogenous uh, uh, aggravation, exacerbation of the crisis, of the liquidity crisis, uh, due to uh, the, uh, um, the uh, hypertrophic uh, development of the, of the speculative apparatus, um, requires a new type of uh, situation, uh, engage with the platform economy and this new uh, relation of forces, not only with respect to labor, this new uh, very uh, tyrannical uh, uh, situation, totalitarian situation, market situation with respect to labor force and all the conditions of life, the penetration of the capital logic in every condition of life today, even uh, exacerbated uh, due to the uh, home labor uh, uh, during the, the pandemic crisis um, and the possibilities of a new of a new platform a technological platform of, of labor exploitation but also but also in terms of the subordination of subsumption of uh, uh, productive capital and that, in, that includes a monopolic productive capital through a new, um, uh, the simile of the metaphor is related to uh, the mafia protection required by pro any uh, productive enterprise, and productive enterprise. Uh, 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 this time uh, uh, functioning like uh, uh, protection against uncertainty. As an uncertainty provoked precisely due to this hypertrophic development of the uh, hypertrophic and parasitarian development of the uh, speculative apparatus so through derivatives, through uh, shadow banking, through the shadow budget, especially due to the wars and the intelligence apparatus uh, of, the, of the NATO uh, uh, operations worldwide. Um, the uh, offshore and the tax havens. And with the new, the new development uh, articulated to the new, this new platform of confluence between the platform, the economic, the um, productive economic apparatus like uh, uh, Uber, uh, 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 Facebook, uh, um, and all all type of 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 imprescindible uh, uh, mechanisms of operation of of uh, of the the. the but you can still call a real economy and the fictitious capital, the fictitious economy linked to the speculative apparatus. And this um, key uh, articulation that has been developed in the, in the last few months, not only the last seven years, is related to the private cryptocurrencies. The private cryptocurrencies and the parallel constitution of a new system of payments um, Parallel to the uh, already existing pyramid of uh, uh, of the payment system uh, controlled by the by the Anglo American uh, uh, banking network with the IMF, World Bank, and the Bank of International Settlements, uh, because these are not um, a, a, a enough anymore. They needed a new type of uh, uh, cuspid of the of vertice of of the system. In this time, related to the chips, the clearinghouse interbank payment system, totally, totally um, outside of any type of uh, governmental control, any type of regulation, because for the first time in, 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 in millennia, the powers that define which is uh, what is uh, uh, legitimate. Which, which is not legitimate, which is normal and which is an abnormal, which is legal and which is not, uh, which, which is not legal, uh, are uh, imposing the laws, imposing the norms, and uh, immediately violating these norms. 
They use normally, they use this type of mechanisms of, of black and white binary mechanisms of dequalification in order to construct their power and the legitimation. But this time they cannot, they cannot uh, help themselves uh, to violate, to violate, permanently violate the rules that they had imposed just the day before. That has happened with the dot franc uh, reforms in the United States that had happened with the uh, 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 financial reforms in the European Union. That is at the core of the explanation of Brexit as uh, the liberation of the city of London in order to, to have a, a, a anarchy, in order to have a free way in this uh, new horizon of uh, speculative development. And this is, of course, a huge uh, danger, not only for democracy in the world, but, but for, for, for peace and, and, and civilization in the world. In the previous structural crisis of overproduction, the solution of the elites had been related to destruction, war, uh, 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 manipulation. Uh, the First and the Second World War were precisely the response to the previous crisis of, uh, of uh, uh, overproduction of merchandises, but also overproduction of capitals linked to the decline of the uh, British hegemony. Today, uh, the instruments that they had to uh, uh, perturb, to, 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 to control the lives of 8 billion human beings are also uh, linked to a horizon of uh, population reduction. Sometimes these guys under, under the pretenses of, of uh, ecological con concerns of the pretenses of, of uh, very high uh, humanitarian causes. But at the end of the day, uh, the type of immediate, immediate uh, challenges that we have to face are enormous. Uh, the, most, uh, the most urgent uh, uh, tasks are related to the uh, famine crisis that I mentioned uh, before, but also the prevention of the new debt crisis that are going to uh, 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 put all the countries in the South against, against each other in the picking order in which, for example, these uh, marvelous uh, uh, initiatives like the, the, um, the new Silk Road uh, promoted by China or the BRICS could be broken up from inside due to desperation to obtain a, 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 a excedent surpluses in, in dollars in order to pay the debt. That happened already with the previous uh, debt crisis. All the uh, third world uh, and the, the socialist countries uh, struggles uh, within the, interna the, the international scenario, uh, including the United Nations around the new uh, uh, economic order, the, 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 the defense of the terms of exchange with respect to the, the products of the South, the possibility of, of a new mechanism, uh, new architecture of, of, of peace and development were totally obliterated by this type of uh, 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 mechanisms of, 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 of blackmailing and reduction of economic it's sovereignty. And today we are facing precisely the same scenario. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Pedro Pei, Professor Pei, and Professor Wen had met in person multiple times in the past. He had also visited Beijing and even visited one of the projects I was engaged in to his residence park. So he has he is an old friend of our forum. I believe later we may have opportunity to listen to Professor Pedro intensively when where he will be the presenter later. And by now, we've collected dozens of questions from different channels to be posed to Professor Wen and the other discussants. I would like to first of all remind you that maybe we do not have the time to respond to all of them. So maybe we will choose like three or four of them. So uh, sorry that they may not be able to answer all of them because we've got so many of them. 
So the prepared yours won't be answered. We just the, the Professor Michael Hudson and Beverly Silver are also here today. And actually they will be the speakers of tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. So is there anything you two would like to say or respond or comment or add? Uh, we would like to invite Professor Hudson to give us a few words. Thank you. I, I very much appreciated what Professor Wen said. And uh, what he said is something that is not realized in the United States. There is a conflict between China and the United States, but it's not a conflict over trying to play the same economy, not trying to play the same game. What there is, is a conflict between economic systems. And Professor Wen has very clearly described what this conflict is. In China, the system is uh, creating money and credit to develop the real economy, to uh, provide funding for state-owned enterprises, to provide infrastructure, to provide basic services for the economy at the lowest price possible. The United States does quite a different uh, thing. The aim is not to make uh, the economy richer. The aim is to make money by financial means. And that was a common denominator of all of the uh, discussions today. Uh, the United States uh, uh, tries to become a wealthy economy with high living standards without any industry, without manufacturing, purely by getting the rest of the world into debt to itself and uh, by ownership rights over the commanding heights of uh, China, Russia, uh, the global south, uh, so that somehow without working at all, the United States can uh, live uh, much better than the economies that are actually doing the work uh, and uh, producing uh, the goods and services and raw materials for the rest of the world. Uh, this is called globalism, but it used to be called colonialism. Uh, so we're dealing with a kind of euphemism instead. Uh, and this euphemism uh, is spread in the United States. How would uh, President Biden have uh, said, what, tried to describe what Professor Wen described? Pro Professor Biden says the conflict between the United States and Russia is between democracy and autocracy. The funny thing is that he's, the democracy is supposed to be the United States, not China. The United, by democracy, he means an oligarchy uh, of uh, basically a financial oligarchy uh, of the banks controlling production and Wall Street being the planning center of American finance capitalism. So by autocracy, what he means is a government such as China that is strong enough to prevent a financial oligarchy from taking over. An autocracy is a country like China able to keep money and credit in the public sector to be used for public goods. So when China creates money, it's to uh, provide means of production, to increase the living standards, to build housing, to build transportation, to do all of the things that has made it the leading uh, economy. In the United States, when banks create money, it's to uh, buy stocks and bonds. It's to buy control of foreign economies and it's to spend military bases all over the world to try to prevent other countries from becoming uh, free of all of this. So basically you do have these two economic systems. And the reason the United States says that China is its number one enemy is because China poses a threat of a socialist economy actually succeeding in raising living standards in a way that the capitalist financial economies cannot do. Uh, that's, that's the threat. There's no acknowledgement of uh, China's success or why it is successful because of its completely different uh, monetary systems. And uh, uh, both uh, my friend, uh, Professor uh, Buzgalan and uh, the uh, uh, Ecuador uh, official have pointed out how are the global South countries going to react to this? Uh, uh, the global South countries have been colonized financially 
not uh, uh, by the old type of uh, English uh, British imperialism, but by by debt. Uh, this summer, we're going to see a crisis throughout the global south as energy prices go up now that they've sanctioned Russia, as food prices go up, and uh, the dollar is strengthening because interest rates are going up. This is creating a balance of payments crisis for the global south. Uh, China and Russia are offering an alternative means of development, uh, developing uh, for their own populations. And as uh, President Xi has said, uh, uh, democracies, political in the West, have not been very successful in preventing finance from taking over. Uh, but uh, a real democracy, you need an administrative class to defend against finance and to act on behalf as the planners of uh, society. That's exactly uh, what's working there. How will the global south uh, uh, deal? There's going to have to be a choice, and that is what uh, the real Cold War uh, is going to be about. Who is going to uh, dominate? Will it be uh, the way Professor Wen has described by the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, uh, or will it be by the International Monetary Fund uh, getting countries in debt and imposing austerity? So you have two futures of the world. Either you have uh, growth and uh, prosperity, such as China has achieved in the last uh, generation, or you'll have austerity by the IMF. This is really the choice. It's a choice between socialism or barbarism. And you've described the dynamics very clearly, and I thank both of all of you. Oh, thank you, Professor uh, Hudson. Thank you, Professor Hudson. We've held more a lot of webinars on Professor Hudson's views, and we've uploaded a lot of videos on Bilibili's. So you can go there to learn more about his thoughts. Thank you very much. And then what Professor Beverly Silver want to say just a few words? So uh, anyway, as usual, um, I agree completely with pretty much everything that Professor Wente Jun said. Um, it's a real pleasure after many years of uh, kind of not seeing each other, well, you know, in person anyway, um, to hear his uh, latest thinking. So uh, I have been, I think this question of the uh, either uh, open default or uh, hidden default uh, on the US debt uh, towards its alleged enemies. So certainly the, uh, the fact that the Chinese, the debt owed to China is almost certainly not gonna be paid either again, directly or indirectly through inflation or through just like a refusal to pay back, uh, you know, the example of what happened with uh, Taliban's money, the Afghanistan money in US banks, etc. So I think this is a, it's a fundamental challenge um, that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit tomorrow. Um, and uh, I, I guess my question for Professor Wen is um, how prepared is, is China um, for this likely eventuality and how, uh, you know, can the, I know that you have ideas about uh, in terms of ecological civilization about how to, um, to manage this kind of crises and these kinds of shocks. Um, so that's one question is, is the, the capability to manage the shock. And then the other thing um, I agree completely that is this question about the link between the crisis of capitalism and, um, and the danger of war or in actual, the actual, and the actuality of war right now. And again, that's something um, that I'll talk about more tomorrow, but I think it's, it's an important thing to to have raised. So I just thought those two things, uh, I mean, many things were of great interest in Professor Wen's talk, but I, I'll just point to those two things, and one of which is a question. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly Silver, Prof, Professor uh, Silver. So tomorrow, these two professors, I mean, Professor Hudson and Professor Silver Lee, will have their 
have their uh, speech. And also tomorrow we will have Professor Wen as moderator. So it will be very, uh, it'll be very interesting uh, sessions tomorrow and also the day after. Now let's invite Professor Wen uh, to see whether if you have some comments to the uh, discussants comments and then later on we also have some questions from the chinese audience now for the moment we have four questions from the chinese audience audience and also later on we will invite you for the answer now first of all please do respond to the discussions thank you thank you for the discussions uh, thank you for uh professor Pustalin and also uh, Pedro Baez and also Professor Hassan plus, the, uh, plus uh, Professor Silver. Thank you for your comments. Everybody has, has comment, your comments actually are complimentary. So what I would like to do is to, to combine my speech and also the comments you, you, you just made. First of all, China can put the national financial capital as a factor in the history of capitalism. Capital is something inevitable, but would we rather be controlled by the capital or to use it? This is a question. In the process of using it, capital has its endogenous problem and is also inevitable. The major turn of China is called the taking the lead out of the domestic cycle and to build a unified market, a unified domestic market. So this is the two major concepts. One is the domestic cycle. The other one is the domestic market. This is when we are facing a series of challenges proposed by the America because of we are trying to delink. And this is what the government's re, uh, response, that is to build the domestic, domestic unified market and the domestic cycle, which has a very, has a big difference uh, from, the, from the past history. So I would like, so that's the first point that this change this adjustment is fundamental. And the orientation is the ecological civilization. So we are talking in this dom in this South Southern, we're talking about the end, the collapse of modern, modern civilization. The new civilization that we are going to enter is not the capitalist civilization, but an ecological one. So it's not just having a economic foundation, but also have a superstructure plus all kinds of culture, but the core is the harmony between human being and the nature. In order to do that, we have to change. We have to change lots that we do in the past, which is not a kind of coexistence between the human and the nature. The damage to the nature majorly happens in the process of the industrial industrial uh, capitalism. So this is a major, major turn. So we are going to the ecological civilization in the direction of ecological civilization. What we need is also a, a new form of production, a new way of production. So it's not the old one as the capitalist one or the capitalist or, 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 the, or the socialism that comes from the capitalist, but a new way that has the Chinese characteristic, a new socialism that with the Chinese characteristics. So we are using this as a, we, we knew this is an urgent mission, although it is also a long-term objectives. The reason why it is urgent because we now are facing the possibility of an imminent war. Whenever the war erupts, we are talking about the regional conflicts earlier, once it started, the China's as uh, all the sea, all the sea uh, transportation, transportational methods are going to be paused right away. 
whether it is a, 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 a transportation of energy or, or all kinds of key commodities. So we don't have time. In China, domestically, there are lots of there are lots of this kind of outward orient, oriented uh, economic interest block. They cannot catch up with this kind of uh, change of orientation, change of 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 uh, of the of the uh, policies. So for the moment, China also has a very complex um, complex uh, this kind of uh, discussions inside China, but so the, which also make them more vulnerable to the American discourse. There would be an inevitable chaos of people's mentalities and the discourse. So the next few years is also a very key period for China. The practice in China should be, what we are doing should have uh, this positive orientational uh, function, because this is different from the intelligent, all those intellectuals who has, who has received the Western style higher education. They have a very different view of uh, from us. So this for till here, this is my comment to the to the uh, comments from earlier. Thank you, Professor Wen. I have just mentioned that in our Zoom uh, and also in the uh, Chin Chinese uh, platform, we have lots of we have collected lots of uh, questions from the Chinese audience, but we don't have time for all of them. So we have choosed some from the uh, from the audience um, and we'll ask Professor Wen to answer that those first question. The first question is in the past, the counter cyclical adjustments, whether on in the industrial capital or financial capital, the policies have a more specific investment object and also have the ability to see, and also it's possible to see more or less the long-term or short-term cycle returns. So now we have this counter cyclical adjustments to towards the ecological civilization. What are the, ben, what are the benefits and also what are the institu institutional costs of this transformation strategy? We know that China is a, we have the, the, the geography has a three tiers and also covered five different types of, uh, of a climate, climate. We have a very rich resources of uh, ecology. When they are, when they are, um, when they are capitalized also, or well, when they are become a value, they can produce wealth, they can produce some interest, especially in the areas is in the mountains where they have where there is rich resources of new, uh, where there is rich natural resources so in the past this mountain area that has been ne neglected of the cap uh, by the cap capitalists now they will have an inflow of governmental investment governmental capital now there is a policy a very important one that we are going to instead of investment we argue the government the government's investment is going to use the form in the form of share for the for the collective economy so the villages and fixed assets is going to be realized by the government's uh, share by the government's investment for example earlier we have mentioned about the five connections for example the roads the roads belong to whom and who is going to management the road about the power who is going to in charge of the the, the power uh, infrastructure infrastructure and also all of those pool, uh, po 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 uh, polarization easing projects we have all this kind of physical assets they can be changed into um change into the share share rights and it's going to be charged it's going to be managed by the collectives and all the dividends all the interests are going also be managed by the village collective 
For example, if there is some company going to the mountain area to trying to produce, you know, the ginseng, so they will need some roads to build into the mountain. And now the village will, the village, the collective will have the chance to collect some interest from the road building, from the all these kind of spatial resources, and the interest is, is going to be to be to be to be paid to every villagers who is the shareholders of this collective. So in this way, the exploration of the spatial resources under the system of the unified market will allow the collective and also the farmer have a long term dividends from the resources. So now the government already have a very clear policy that the investments are going to be divided into small items. So now it's almost like the the there is more liquid liquidity for the villagers. In the face of the globalization, of the crisis of the globalization, lots of migrant workers are going back to their hometowns. Now they will have more chance of 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 employment in their own village and also in the in the in the form of cash. Now that the village has their fixed asset, they also have liquidity using as using the, the the social enterprises as the major as the as the uh the social enterprises as the subjective subjectivity they are going to be they are going to be respond of the the, the exploration of the resources because they are they are living in that places they are not going to do any damage their 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 environment so this kind of social enterprises is going to to protect the local environment at the same time so that we can at a, we can we can we can combine the restructure of the village economy while protecting the environment so in this way this is an example of how china's the the the, the socialism with chinese characteristics that the in which the village can earn the profits from the in the form of the share holding enterprises in the form of this microeconomic subjective so that the marginalized the marginalized population which is the farmers can have uh, can 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 um, benefit from this uh, the, this uh, policy change. Thank you, Professor Wen. Now we have the second question. Well, the second question from our audience. Under the current economic situation, will there be the collapse of the middle class? If it happens, this rejuvenation of the rural area is oriented with the middle class, like grain consumption or other similar engagements, will this still be successful? Well, there are two things. Maybe this collapse of the middle class and rejuvenation of the rural areas, they may not be, they are not on the same plane and they are not very commonplace phenomena. They are happened by a few, a handful of U.S. economists. They coined this word to describe the case where, in some countries, they have a, a foreign-oriented economy that relies on shift of industry, where their accumulation cannot be used to upgrade their industry so they still do not have a complete industrial system so this foreign oriented system when faced with decline in foreign demand they may face economic crisis and they'll have the so-called collapse of the middle class in fact i don't think this is a very complete theory, it's just a coinage for a concept. In China, the 
our situation is that people with medium income they just have a little bit of accumulation but they and they invest all their money in real estate and they invested their money at the height of the market in the past they can mark their property their their level of richness with how many houses or how many apartments they have yet now their their housing depreciated this is a specificity of a certain era but the rural area is not heavily influenced by this we know that the rejuvenation of the rural area first of all is led by the government to install infrastructure in rural areas and then the conversion of both the urban and the rural area through different ways of enterprising of mobilizing the masses to participate in entrepreneurship in the rural area this is a combination for a process of convergence they do not need uh they do not have in the, the the investment the capital is not insufficient in this regard they don't need much what they need maybe someone should need to bring their skills or intellect into this regard that may work well with the current development but not they're not in need of capital so the bulk of the resources in rural areas are in the form uh in, in the physical form and they haven't been vitalized yet so when we look at this problem we believe that the rejuvenation of rural area may be a unprecedented historical opportunity for the middle class who are facing some urban headaches they can see that some residents former rural residents who return on some urban residents who go to the rural areas are benefiting from this we cannot say that all of them are very successful in their engagement but they are doing far and better than living than their urban life would have been this is my answer for this thank you uh, uh, thank you thank you professor Wen. i think this question is similar to many of the interactions we receive from our audiences so, and this is because many of the audiences are just students or just graduated so they're in a relatively difficult stage of their career or their life it's a bit difficult for them and they are also worrying for the so-called middle class for those people for this middle class who own housing that they have to make clear that they can no longer become a part of the middle class because of owning housing in the urban area there is no room for for this development we have to know that the broad opportunities are with the rural areas now here i would like to read out the third problem the infrastructure going to the rural area does it in, include health care education and other sort of public services a lot of construction in this regard while this cause a lot of burden for the budget for the government's budget and the cost of our in the end be shift to the general public the mass population so this question is generally about expanding infrastructure now it costs more burden and now this burden in turn cause difficulties to the general population when the the masses will need to shoulder this burden so it's a question on rejuvenating the rural area through infrastructure i understood the question first of all about the that well increasing that it cannot be solved by 
paying off the stamps by the mass population, but by increasing the scale of assets created by these stamps, especially when they can turn eco resources into useful capital. So this kind of investment is of use. Similarly, in in this terms of in this kind of trade, currency is also assets, especially when there is stable political serenity. They can empower currency through this political serenity and create credit in currency. And in this regard, there will be a double expansion of both the currency and financial, uh, sorry, real and monetary assets will be both expanding. When they both expand, that will become smaller. That are not to be paid on. Uh, in the past system where the fiscal and the financial system are the same thing like before 1998 in China, in this under this system, they are the same credit. So they cannot shift from one to the other. Just as we said, the Fed print money to buy the US national bonds are uh, even in the US market to buy a company that so they're actually have two different systems that can complement each other. But as we said, the US that are not used on production. So when they expand to a certain degree, they would have a debt crisis. In China, on the other hand, the debts are used for production for those underdeveloped like mountainous areas where they do not have investment. So the country invests on behalf of them. So China's debt would create productivity. Therefore, no country is letting the whole population to pay out, pay back the debts. In the only in developing countries in the 1970s to 1990s, in the West, those creditors they used the IMF or World Bank to force developing countries to sell their national capital or their resources to promote privatization, to force them to pay. So this is a hegemonic way. If a developing country can expand their assets, their debt will also always be on the decline. This is an evolutionary process. I wish everyone to understand that debt itself is a financial gain. If we can guarantee that a country with full sovereignty can be able to resolve its debt crisis. We've also talked that countries with resource sovereignty, they can even free ride the money printing that drive up commodity prices from the hegem hegemonic countries. They can free ride this practice as long as they have their own resource serenity, they can benefit from this. This is actually a game in the modern era of financial capitalism. We hope those listeners who raise these questions be confined to textbooks, uh, college textbooks. Don't let them control you. Take more look at what is really happening around the world. And then these problems or these issues will no longer bother you that much. Thank you, Professor Wen. Professor Wen had been extremely kind. I think your questions are also questions posed to yourself. Once you raise a question, 
well, they've seen like a, dozens of them, just them. Of course, we cannot, sorry, we cannot reply to all of them. No matter how good or bad is the question. It not only is a question posed to Professor Wen, it is also a process where you look back within yourself to see that how you don't have sufficient knowledge in what regards like some of you worry about rich people's issues you don't even know which class you're in well that might be a little bit of an issue so in the last question i just mentioned the audience who raised this question put the general masses and the superstructure on opposing positions. So if you see the keywords from Professor Wen, this big internal cycle and big market, you can see that it's not the same thing. We're not talking about right or wrong, but hope to provoke your thoughts. And then one last question, I'm sorry. We hope that we can have more opportunities for exchange. Uh, more questions are coming, but we're very sorry that we cannot read out every one of them. And we hope that if you have the opportunity, you can discuss and talk with each other in our talk groups. And for the more valuable questions, we may hold other seminars so that Professor Wen can answer them personally during those seminars. And then the next question is about something that we're most familiar with. So the capital goes to the rural area. In this form of rural rejuvenation, capital, but forcefully going to the more powerfully going to the rural area to give the villages more bargaining power with the capital we say that they need to organize the villages so this question is how to how to unite them is collective economy in an effective way especially even now the job market is not looking good so the one who raised the question is a college student how to participate he, he or she would like to know thank you first of all i would like to um i would like to uh, express my gratefulness to this student because he would like to participate to this uh, movement of uh, rural reconstruction but before you make a decision you have to you have to collect more data collect more experience from the different places where they have been starting this kind of rural risk rural reconstruction because i i think you should not just look just jump into your de your decision. You can try to, for example, uh, try to reach out to the organizations where which has been involved in the rural reconstruction and to reach out to find out what you can do in this movement. Because now we, as we, we mentioned earlier, now the national policy already make it very clear. We are going to, uh, we are going to change there's a uh, three change first of the 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 resources going to become the uh the 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 uh, assets and the villagers is going to become the shareholders so now it's a change of production what we can do more at especially at this kind of uh, situation we can make use of the rich ecological resources that we possess as a big uh country last uh, a few times ago i was in the village in the in the mongolia and the one villager told me that they, they showed me there is a uh, they showed me the the miner the wind mine uh plantation and that so this company comes to the village and they're trying to negotiate and the old time they're like uh so at that time they the whole village rent out their their their, their land but so so what, what the company do they just change they just buy some individually buy individually uh the land and then just build the the the, the wind mile and then make money out of it 
So at that time, the village only only gained like each household only gets two hundred. But now all the villagers form a collective. The the collective they go to negotiate with the company. If you if the company wants to build a windmill, then you have to you have to buy the whole you have to buy or rent the whole piece of land. You cannot just do like you can do just lot by lot, piece by piece. You have to negotiate with the whole village. You know, so and also we want to work. We want the employment, we want the job opportunity in your place. So now, because every wind mile company are trying to reach out, trying to go to the villages and trying to trying because now it's an emergent economy. They are trying to find land. We were talking about like the the resources. The resources are like spatial resources. They are priceless. The wind doesn't have a price. So once you have the wind mile, you can make money. But in order to do that, you have to negotiate the whole co-op. And the whole cooperative, they say that you not only that you have to, you are occupying my you're occupying this land for the mile, but you also have to build all those cables and all those also needs to pay a rent. So now all the villagers can gain more interest, much more interest than when there's only one village, one villager to negotiate the whole company. So that is one capacity that they earn again in this process, the capacity to negotiate. So if you are a student of accountants or doing accountants or this kind of negotiation, then you have a chance to 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 um, to make use of your your talent in the village because they want to they want to raise the value of the land. So, for example, if this is a, a desert land, how do we how can we how can we cultivate this land? We have several now we have several ways to do with it because you want to reinvest in it for example you can grow some grow some uh, some grass for the uh, for the livestock etc so this is a whole chain and in the old time when this where this where the land is uh, is 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 um is is a desert now we have use we have make use of it I, I think maybe this dude uh, this uh this student didn't doesn't learn much from our past uh, lectures and also articles we have already uh, a rich a rich uh, rich discussion on this such topic with uh, especially a, a newly launched book called the from from agricultural 1.0 to agricultural 4.0. So this is my suggestion. Before you make the decision to jump into some some uh, some 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 this kind of uh, job opportunities, I would like you to because now that the, all the textbooks are kind of uh, rigid, and they don't doesn't have many real life experience in it. So I would like you to reach out to the to the to the other experience before you make the decision. That's all. Thank you, Professor Wen. So. Tonight, we have a very interesting discussion and also very and also very uh, a good start for the uh, following speeches of the next few days. And we can we also see like lots of the moderators speakers from the next speech next uh, lectures. So tonight, tomorrow night, Professor Wen is going to be the moderator of this speech by um, Beverly Silva. And tonight we have already uh, run out of the other time as we have time difference among uh, in the whole globe. Now in the whole in Beijing time is already 1037 at night. So I would like to uh, to say thank you for all the speaker and discussions, also the participants. Now let's see if our um, if the if our organizing team for uh, any any words from Professor Lao Qingqi or, 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 or Professor Migrate. See, and I will also welcome everybody in the in the uh, Zoom. Can turn on your camera and to say say hi and also say bye to all uh, to the professor 
Professor Wen. And so thank you, everyone. And this is the end of tonight's session. Thanks again to the uh, discussions and the speaker, Professor Wen. We will see you tomorrow night.